Revelation 22 and 1. And he showed me a pure river. We sang it. We sang it. A pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bears twelve fruits, yielding her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. And they shall see His face and His name in their foreheads, their mind, the mind of Christ. I wake up with Jesus on my mind. I walk through the day with Jesus on my mind. I do everything in Jesus. I go to bed in Jesus, you're on my mind. You wake me up in the middle of the night, Jesus, because you're on my mind. And there shall be no more night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, the natural realm. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you brought your word across this day, Lord God. Father, I thank you for these people, each and every one of them, God. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Tim, I can't see. I can't see it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hey, hey, it's a good thing. It's a great day. Oh, excuse me for a second. I just, hopefully I don't have too much running down, but that's all right. You know what? You know what I really want to do? I'm going to tell you what I really want to do. I just want to talk about Jesus. Seriously. I just want to talk about Jesus. Sometimes we go through whatever we go through because we're still carnal in a lot of ways. But every now and then, Jesus 
knows how to get certain things across without you even realizing it. You know what's, you know what's amazing? I got a phone call this week. And it wasn't nothing much. It wasn't nothing. Just somebody just encouraging. And that's all it takes. And I tell you what, that lifted me up. Because sometimes you sit there and you wonder, God, do people even really listen to what you're doing? Or is this just for me? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. But the, I'm not going to bounce because people don't like being pointed out. But I want to thank the one who called me. And they know who called me. I get taxes along the way. Every now and then. You know, God is amazing. He is totally amazing. He just knows how to... And yes, he'll use modern day technology to do it. Sometimes. But he is... He is large and in charge. And the more I... The more I fall in love with him, the more I realize his plan. See, I can, I can show you this. You want to see something? Brother Kelly, in his book, he drew all this. It was um, Samuel's ministry of all where he went. Everybody see that? It's a little small. But Brother Kelly, he drew this out freehand. But it's on a piece of paper. It's a plan. But God's plan, it's alive. It's alive. We are written epistles, read by everyone, inside the room and outside the room. We're looking for something what's Stable, set one spot. Well, that's why he's no longer in Solomon's temple. He's put it right back to where it was destined to be from the beginning, in the heart of man, in the heart of mankind. You want proof? You want facts. We love proof, and we want facts. I'll give it to you. You want proof and facts? I'm going to give it to you. First Samuel 6.20. We're going to start there, and we're going to go from there. You don't have to put it up there if you don't want to. All right? And the men of Beth Shemesh said, listen to these words. Who is able to stand before the Holy Lord God? Question. And to whom shall he go up from us? Question number two. You want answers? They ask questions. Old Testament, they ask questions. New Testament answered the questions. Who is able to stand? Ephesians 6.10. Ready? You guys ready? You ready? Finally. Finally. <sighs> Finally. Finally. After everything was, took place, he wrote before this. It's finally come down to this. Finally. My brethren, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, not yours, in his. Because when we are weak, he is strong. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand 
against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age or world. See, the crazy thing is, the enemy, he's so stupid, he keeps repeating himself. He keeps repeating himself. We can prove that fact, too. How can we prove that fact? We got a whole Bible of the Old Testament proving his fact that God, who created everything, is mighty. Remember my little thing? Man thinks he can create man. Go ahead. Oh, wait a second. You make the dirt first. Got the picture? You got the picture? Man thinks he's so smart. But really, make dirt. You know, it's funny. Dave, can I say this? Can I talk about it for a little bit? I'm going to. Because David, he's my man. I don't know what God did, but the first time I let, met David LaPointe, God knitted us together, not by flesh and blood, by spirit. And you want to know something? We were both young and dumb and didn't know any better. But God knew what he was doing because God seen the end from the beginning. I'm sorry, I just put you out. You better put on your whole armor, buddy. I'm serious. But Brother David, we had a little issue here in the ladies' bathroom. Nothing against you ladies, but it just happened to be in the ladies' bathroom. The exhaust fan in there was, in, it was making some funny noises. So Brother David says to he goes, hey, I, uh, I was looking at the bathroom and fan to see what the noise was, and he took it out of the ceiling. And he said, oh, my gosh, was it filled with dirt. Now, because I install, well, I thank God I don't install them no more, but I work on them. Exhaust fans in regular bathrooms like this, Really, they don't pick up dirt. All they're doing is expelling stench. Exhaust the name, exhaust. But in your house, it exhausts moisture and stench. And if anybody's ever cleaned them, see, here's the whole thing. If you don't maintain... You're going to get filled with dirt without even knowing it. We've been in this building since 2001. We did the renovations in 2003. And I guarantee you, I know I didn't take any. I cleaned the covers, but I've literally never taken it down to clean the fan, the squirrel cage in there and all that stuff. And eventually, all that dirt and dust, it took a toll on the motor. So we had to replace it, which is fine. That, that does happen. And he said, while I'm at it, I might as well go to, you can't just have one, you got to go to both sides. And he took it apart. And he said, the men's side was worse than the ladies' side. Ha ha. Ha ha ha. Much is given, much is required. <laughs> but the crazy thing is, is neither one of us knew that just sucking out air had so much dirt in it. But God did. Show and tell, Dave. Show and tell. All right? Oh, so where were we? So we wrestled now. We already did that. So wherefore? 
Take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. What they say about the day of the Lord is dark. And what's it to you? But he's, hey, he's put the light inside us that we can stand in the midst of it. That you can shine. Not go around, oh, yeah. No, 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 no. That you can stand. You know, remember Muhammad Ali? This is crazy thought. I just got a crazy thought. Crazy, I'm going to say it because it's crazy. Remember Muhammad Ali? All you young folks probably don't understand, but anybody who's a sports nut said he was the greatest. Did he say he was the greatest boxer of all time? And I tell you what, in my short little lifespan, out of everybody that I've seen box, he was probably the greatest I've ever seen. The one I'd like to see is him and Mike Tyson go at it one time, but that was besides the point. He was just a plain nut, but that's besides the point. But Muhammad Ali did one thing. He came up with this theory called rope the dope. Rope a dope. And every time the enemy came up to him, he leaned back on the rope. And he was going back and forth, but he never fought and never did. He just blocked, took it, blah, blah, blah. A couple of them stung every now and then. But I tell you what, when he got his chance, bam, down they went. And that's what God does. He puts you in there to play rope-a-dope. And 90% of the time, 99.9.999999% of the time, it's right here. This is the devil. Because why? He thinks, he sits in the temple of God thinking that he is God And you know what? And the Bible's plain. The Bible says, put on the mind of Christ. Reckon the old man dead. Reckon him. God, how in the world? We know it's an accounting number. Take an account. All right, he's dead, blah, blah, blah. But you want to know something? God say, okay, now we're going to put it to work. We're going to put it to work. But he's given us every tool to stand. To stand. Therefore, stand, therefore, having your loins, the things that you produce, girded about with truth. Whose truth? Jesus. Jesus, you're on my mind. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, Jesus. Your feet sided with preparation of the gospel of peace, Jesus, and above all. So that's, so there's something higher, right? Above all, taking the shield of faith, the trials of our faith are more precious than gold. Carol, what did I say to you just a little bit ago? Gold, gold is great. Gold is great, but I wanted to possess the one who, pres who made the gold. You can have this thing what's corruptible. You can have this thing. You can have it. I want the one who made it all. And you know what? He's right here. He's right here. Right here. Right here. Believest thou this? but my world is going upside down. Thank you, Jesus. He don't want you to be of this world. You're in it, but he don't want you of it. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to, stand, be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, Jesus, the mind of Christ, and the sword of the Spirit, 
which is the Word of God, written and spoken. We've known that. That's, that's plain. We've been taught very well on that. But the spoken word better line up with the written word because it's the anchor. It's the anchor. It's the anchor. You want to know something? In a boat wreck, the only thing that doesn't get hurt is the anchor. Praying always with all prayers and supplications in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all the saints. For all the saints. Yes, we are saints. Believe us all this? Some days we don't feel like we're a saint. Brother Bud calls Sister Burn Saint Burn all the time. But see, that's just what man, and I'm not making fun of Brother Bud, but that's what man, that's what man did, and that's what we think of as man. But God looks at us as pure, holy, righteous. The one he's willing to put himself in. <sighs> Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Let's go back to 1 Samuel 6, 20. Oh, wait a second. I didn't answer the second question. I'm sorry. Let's answer the second question. The second question was what? Anybody remember? That was who can stand in front, in front of the holy box and who is able to see God, right? So we'll go to Matthew 5, verse 8. Brother Ed, you should know this one. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. Where are they going to see God? Somewhere's out? Nope. You better see them in the, your brother and sister next to you. Because Jesus said, Jesus, you know, the one who's always on my mind? The one who should be always, who's always on your guys' mind? Jesus said, you'll see me no more until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then we got a little incident that took place that the disciples went to Jesus and says, hey, they're preaching another Jesus. What did Jesus say? Just leave them alone. It's getting preached. And you know what's going to happen? In the wash, this is my paraphrase, in the wash, it's all going to work out. He's going to see. He knows. He knows. And you want to know something? His sheep know. They know his voice. Hallelujah. 1 Samuel 6, back to verse 23. I went back to these two before we go jumping into chapter 7. All right? Because the first two verses of chapter 7 really go inside with chapter 6. So you, I, I'm trying to group them all together. But as I was studying... And all of a sudden, this little bit started, God started showing me this little thing this morning. And I'm like, all right, Lord, this is, this is good. This is good. I better get the notes out and write it down. I'm not writing notes because I'm not a note person. I'm not an old person. But I'm willing to change. I am willing to change. So... 
Ah, uh, let's see. Do I have the right verse here? Because I went to the wrong one. Is chapter twenty, First Samuel one. Whoa, 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 whoa. Come on, Stephen. Technology. That's why they don't give me one at work. They'd have to pay me to learn how to use it, and they don't want to do that. So the men of Bethlehemish, Beth Shemesh, said, "Who is able to stand before the Lord?" Before this holy Lord God. And to whom shall he go up from us? And they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Jira Jath Jerim. Thank God we don't have names like that anymore. Saying, The Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. Sheesh, it's amazing that the world has brought the ark of the Lord. Come down, come down, and fetch it up. You know what's funny? This name, Beth Shemesh, remember I went through it? And it means the rising of the sun, or God is sun, light. This is when you get born again. This is what I really look at it. He come in to light, your, to light you up. He's come to take you out of darkness into his marvelous light. But they stood. They wanted to stay at that point. But they wanted to get into something what they shouldn't have got into, and guess what happened? There's a breach. And this, how can I put it this way? They wanted the world in the church. Come as you are. Stephen, don't even go down that road. I'm going to stay right off that road. You know, there's a lot of good old saints. I'm old enough to remember a lot of good old saints don't look like the world, don't act like the world, because you're not of the world. And when the world starts coming into the church, then you start questioning. You don't have to be spiritual to start questioning, why is this happening? We've heard it enough in our 39 years. If you've got to have a program to get people in the church, you're going to need a program to keep them in the church. And that's not God's way. God's way is, I'll draw all men unto me. No man cometh, lest the Spirit draws. And the greatest thing is, he's put that Spirit in you, and you don't even have to do anything. You know, it's funny. Ah, Jesus, why are you doing this to me, God? When I, when I, I'm going to talk to you two. These guys all know it. I'm going to talk to you two. Is that okay? These people don't have to listen. But you see this woman right here? This is no lie. There's a whole big story before we got to there. Someday we'll discuss it over dinner again, all right? But this woman right here, I started dating her. You got to remember, I moved here. You know the story. I moved here, didn't know anybody. And all of a sudden, lo and behold, what happens? Dad, my father, the pastor, kept bugging me to go get my sister at a store. Bring her home from work. And I kept saying, nope, nope, nope. And finally, my dad, he was the saint, screamed at me and said, go get your sister. <laughs> Can't talk like that to kids nowadays. So I drove at night, bummed out, because I had no friends. I had nobody. I was totally isolated. God separated me from everything that I was. And I didn't realize what he was doing. Sent me over there to get my sister. Two people, her and my sister, walk out of the store at night. And all of a sudden, lights. Lights. You know what the crazy thing was? 
I was born again, baptized, but my heart wasn't right with God. Long story even shorter, I go out on a date with her. She shouldn't have put the shoes on, but that's, that's a, her and I's story. So we start dating. We start dating. And all of a sudden, it's getting serious, like real quick. Because you want to know why? I was born again. Didn't have my heart right, but I knew what was right. And I said, God, I don't want any toys. I don't want any mess. And I threw out a fleece to God. I shouldn't have, because my heart wasn't right. But God said to me, all right. I said, and I'm not going to do anything. I'm not saying a word. This is how I'm going to know it's you. And I put out three things. And this is no lie. He came through and came through and came through and he's still coming through. And I'm telling you what? We were driving and I don't know, you guys are about my age. So we know how, you know how it was. You're driving down, you got your sweetie next to you, you're holding hands, you know, you're listening, you're bopping to the music, you're driving, cruising down the road. We're coming down Wilbraham Road, and there used to be on the corner of Wilbraham Road and Parker, there was a Bible and bookstore. Light turned red. So I don't know about you, all you young folks, plug your ears. Yeah. Amen, sister. And you know what? Yes, you can too, son. But be thankful for this stop. So I went like this. When you come to a stop sign or a stoplight, you know what you do. Yeah. Right? You give a little. And when I went like this, that word Bible exploded. I mean exploded. And I didn't get a kiss. But you know what I said to her? I said, one day, I'm telling you right now, you can ask her. I said, one day. I said, Jesus is going to be number one in my life. You're going to have to take number two. And there ain't going to be nobody higher than you except for him. Not realizing what he had in store for my life. Yeah. And has it been all smooth? Nope. You know what I said before about separation? Yep. One thing about coming to God, coming to Jesus, first thing he does is he gets the world out of you. And it takes a lifetime to get it out. And you know why? Because the Bible says if you've got a love of the world, the love of the Father is not in you. That was just between us three. They just got to hear it. But really, they lived it out. They lived through it with me. I literally got a lifetime, just me, how, how God put his finger in my life. You know the story about Paul? I can't even believe I'm saying this, but Paul said, God who separated me from my mother's womb so that he can reveal his son through me. And you know what that poor man went through? Murdered a bunch of people. Very, very smart, very educated, but didn't have the spirit in him. Killed all these people thinking he was doing God's job. Because he was self righteous. Seriously. Until one day, I think we heard something about a donkey today. He got knocked off. And the son, what revealed himself, was brighter than the noonday, natural thing. And he had the audacity to say, 
at the end of his life that God, who separated me from my mother's womb, I can tell you stories after stories, just in Stephen Fraser's little 57 years life, how God has separated me so that he can reveal his son through me. And that's what he did for each and every seed that he's placed in humanity. Because it's no different. The same Holy Ghost what lives in me lives in Josiah, Jennifer, and each and every one of you. Sister Linda, she gets mad at me. She calls. Her neighbors, her, the complex next door to her house is on fire. It's on fire. And she goes, you need to pray, you need to pray. I already prayed. Thank you, God. I agree with her prayer. Same Holy Ghost. She, see, it isn't so much that she needs to call somebody who's over her to say, hey, you need to do something. You know what? The same spirit which is inside me is inside of her. Hey, the same authority. I just agree, so guess what? We compound that spirit. And hey, did everything work out, right? Your place didn't get caught on fire either, did it? No. But he revealed something in what was inside of her that she had to deal with. Isn't that what God does? He reveals the content of our heart. Why? Because that's where he lives. And he don't like a dirty house. He doesn't. It's a pure river. Crystal clear. So that it can flow. For what? See, we're so self-centered, we want it for us. No, it's not for us. We're just the conduit. We've already been down this road. We're just the conduit that he's using, that it can go out into humanity. God, hey, you're killing me. You're killing me, Jesus. You're killing me. Second Samuel, whoop, back. First Samuel, chapter 7, verse 1. And the men of Kara, Kyra, Jack, Jerim. You know what that, mean, that word means? I'm going to give you the definition of this word. This blew me away. This blew me away. A city of forest. As soon as I heard forest, I heard wood. And guess what that means? Humanity. You know what city means? Hang on. I got that too. We'll try this number. Oh, yeah. 5892 from 57. 82, a city, a place guarded by awakening or watch in the wildest sense, even a mere encampment or post. Okay, so if we go back to 57, 82, it's a opening, an awakening, a city family. You can't have a city without people. You can have buildings, and they made a lot of movies about cities with no buildings. You know what, America? We have a lot of towns out west and around here. There are still towns, but there's no people in it. And in their day, they were great towns. But things came along. Time. God wanted to put himself back. These people went down. They were up. Oh, I better read it so I don't really batch it too much. And they came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abdibadad, Ab, A B I N, Adab. Adab. 
one person. A bit of dad. You know what? It's so amazing. I've been reading it for so long, I had it down science. I had it down in here good. I even said it out loud when I'm reading, and it came out great. All of a sudden, boom, what happened? But that's all right. God knows. Confusion. A dividend in the hill. See, these people live in the... See, it's funny, isn't it? It's funny, isn't it? That's what good. Good. But the problem is, these people live in the hill towns. They live in the hill of the Lord. I'll prove that. You want to prove it? You want facts? I'll give you facts. Here's a proven fact. And they sanctify El Ezer, his son. His son. To keep the ark of the Lord. Adibidab. Abdibidab. A father of the willing giver. God's more than willing. God's willing to give you the keys to the kingdom. God's willing to give you the kingdom. But see, he ain't giving it to you on our terms. It's on his terms. Like it or not, it's on his terms. Because there's a purpose behind it. We've heard that all our, right? We've heard that. God's got purpose. What's the purpose? Pure, holy, righteousness, justice, above all else, loving. God so loved the age that he gave. His only son. Here's another crazy thought I had. I got reading today, this week, sometime this week, and I happened to look down. I was just, I was chasing words. You ever chase words and all of a sudden we call them rabbit trails? I got the rabbit. And God, it was good. It was good eating. But remember when Noah had a boat? And he put all kinds of animals on it, right? Did he or did he not? He put dirty animals and clean animals. Now, if you were Noah, would you put dirty animals on a boat? Knowing, because God told him what to do. Hmm. So I guess he didn't act like God. He did what God told him to do. So he put the clean animals and the dirty animals. Another crazy thought. They're on there 40 days, 40 nights. It rained, and then how long they were on afterwards before they even got off the boat. I wonder if the dirty animals started looking at some of those clean animals going, hmm, chop steak. See, we don't think like that. I'm talking to you two again. Is that right? Because they've already heard it. When the water rose... He said it covered the whole earth, right? The whole earth. Think about this. What's the tallest mountain in the world? Is it Everest? They climbed it. And what happens? They made a roller coaster about it in Disney World. But that's besides the point. But they turn around. You need to have what? Oxygen. How come Noah didn't have oxygen? Something kept them alive. You can go through the pit of hell, and he'll keep you alive if your heart's right with him. Hmm. But he's more than willing to give you everything. Because he's a, what? He is a, Father of the willing giver. He's a liberal. That's going to drive the Republicans crazy. He's a willing giver. He gave so much, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, 
who believe on him El easier. So you got God, the willing giver. Oh, wait a second. He had to have a son because he was father. Can't make this stuff up, right? God is helper. Yes, Jesus, you're my help. Look up the names of Jehovah. Look up all the titles of Jehovah. And God was there. Jesus was there. And every bit and aspects of that name, he just condensed it down to one name, Jesus. I woke up this morning with Jesus on my mind. I went to the bathroom with Jesus on my mind. I took a shower with Jesus on my mind. I came here with Jesus on my mind. I'm going to leave here and go get Red Rose Pizza because Jesus is on my mind. I'm going to go home. I'm going to hit the lazy boy. Jesus is going to be on my mind. Because I've come to this conclusion. I've come to this conclusion. If Jesus is on my mind... 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I'm nothing to him. The father of the willing giver, whose house was in the hill, the house of the Lord. The hill of the Lord. They they did something. They charged them. They sanctified them. They made them pure. Jesus. Jesus. To keep to watch, to guard, to protect, preserve, to retain, reserve, observe, and regard the ark of God, his heartbeat. John laid his heart, his head on his heart. Listen to the heartbeat. That was nice, but that same heartbeat, that same heartbeat is inside of us. Protect it, guard it. Keep it. Don't let anything get to it. Pirates of the Caribbean. Nick likes movies. Pirates of the Caribbean, what did they go after? The box. What's the name of the box? Huh? Dead man's chest. But when they opened up the top... What was that heart doing? Can't make this stuff up. You can't. You can't make this stuff up. God literally takes natural things to show us, and it's crazy that he's taking the foolish things This is Brother Kelly's notes, all right? It seemed that the ark was here for almost 100 years. We go down to verse 2. And it came to pass, while the ark abode in Kyra, Jath, Jerim, that the time was long. Pentecost is long. The other town you get born again in. And you think you have everything. But God has another town to go to. He was expecting to go to another town. He wasn't settling 
in the outer court. Remember, God lives in a three-room house. He wasn't staying down in that town just to light your candle. It's great to have your candle lit, but there's something more. He brings you to the next town for what? To put you in a body that you can grow up, that you can get all the rough edges knocked off, that you can get polished together in the quiver so that he can shoot you where he wants to shoot you. And the time was long, for it was 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented for lamented after the Lord. Or there's a groan in the throne for the presence of God. All creation is groaning for the manifestations of the sons of God. We're living in this time, folks. The same groan. They, he, they put a time frame in there. It's just a picture. You've got to remember, this is just a type and shadow. It's just a picture for us to learn something. What got Israel into this state? That the presence of God or the ark of God is no longer in rest. They thought that they could take the heartbeat of God, and bring it to somewheres to conquer something that God's already told them 400 years before when you go into the land, totally utter, every, destroy everything. And they refused to do it. And guess what? 400 years later, I don't know how many descendants down the road you want to go from there. They're still dealing with it. Guess what? So are we. So that tells me it's not a physical aspect that God's dealing with, it's a spiritual thing. You can kill a man. Paul, they whopped his head off. Peter, they whopped his head off. Jesus, they hung him on a cross. And guess what? We're still talking about him. Pastor Dale went by the way of all flesh but he's still alive. He's still alive. How do I know? Because I see, I read the books that are in front of me. And guess what? He didn't rip out any pages. So Brother Kelly says, it seemed that the ark was here for almost 100 years. In the last 20 years, the people of Israel lamented or mourned. Because you know what? God instilled that groan in creation from the fall. After the absence of the, of the glory of Israel upon the ark. Hence... During this long period, hear these words. This is Brother Kelly's. This is Brother Kelly's words. Hence, during the long period, Samuel, Saul, and David are moving into their respective historical setting. Christ like fellowship, we're in that spot. We're moving into our historical setting. You have one what was a prophet, the last of the judges. He even started something that most people never thought they would, monarchy. And in the midst of that, he got bent. He was upset because of what the people were asking for. And God said, listen to them. I'll give them exactly what they wanted. He 
He did. He said, but you know what? To ease you and your mind, go ahead and you tell them what they're going to get. And he did. But at the end of Saul's reign, same prophet who anointed Saul had to turn around, get his clothes ripped from the guy he he anointed, because that's who God picked, to turn around to anoint a little shepherd boy who had a heart after God. Because what what was he doing? He was out in daddy's pasture tending his sheep, making sure no wolves, foxes, or bears to get them. Well, Saul was doing what? Running around for Danny's Daddy's donkeys, the world. They're moving in historical settings. So are we. We're moving into our historical settings. Fun fact. Can I do a fun fact? Fun fact. Brother Kelly's notes. He put a nice little note on the side. The ark was sent from Ekron to Jairah Jath Jerim in 1040 BC. Fact. Here's a fact. 1040 BC. And it remained there 20 years. 1 Samuel 7. To its entry into Zion the third realm, the final realm, the place where God's desire always been. The third room, the eleven room, the green room, the throne room. Zion's. Nick, what did you say? Zion wasn't wasn't the highest hill, but it was the hill that God chose. It's what God wanted. Don't you forget, Mary? Have you forgotten? You were there. The seed what is inside you is holy. I've chosen you. It's entry into Zion in 950 BC was 89 years. hundred years, but the last 20 of them, they were mourning, they were groaning, they wanted the presence of God. Saul didn't go looking for the presence of God, but David sure did. Companion and Amplified Bible, that's where he got those notes out of. Hallelujah. So, Next week, I'm going to deal with verse 7, verse 3, down. And it's Samuel's judgeship. See, we always think that Samuel was a bad dude. We always thought that Samuel was a bad dude, bad prophet. Well, not, a, not in that aspect, but he was mean. Can I say it that way? He was just out of their mind. He was out of their thinking. He was in God's thinking. And God needed a voice. God needed a man to get his word across. To get what? To get the people to where he wanted them. But he wasn't that bad of a guy. He was a good guy. Next week I'll get into his characteristics of Samuel as a leader. Amen? Anybody going away? You going next week? Okay. Come on up. We can, we'll pray for you.
Hallelujah.